so here we are Luxor Temple wow it's been a long journey six months now and this is going to be the last video for a while and then I'll go back to the beginning now just like uh, the Temple of Mut and Karnak you can't really do a tour of Luxor Temple unless you add the content the history so here we are so it was known as the Southern Sanctuary, the Ipet Reset. It was uh, another form of Amun, Amun Ithaphalic form. So uh, a, a god that's able to seed the ground. Amun was originally part of the primeval creation. The elements um, originated at Hermopolis, uh, part of the odd of uh, eight gods, the Kemenu, the eight town. Um, he evolved from Nu. Now there was some debate as to whether uh, Amun was a local deity of Waset or if he was imported in by Amunet I of the 12th dynasty. Now Amunet's family originated from Elephantine and in Elephantine, you had the ram god Kanum. Now, it's interesting to note that Amun also has a form of a ram. Maybe there is a connection between Kanum and um, Amun, and the primary, primary data hasn't been found yet. Or maybe Amunet assimilated the ram as a figure for Amun based on his heritage from Elephantine. So at the start of the 18th dynasty, we have Amosi I. And Amosi I was the younger brother of Kamosi. Remember, Kamosi gave us the stylizing it enemies to the north, the Hyksos, and enemies to the south, the Kushites. So his family, Amosi I's family, have been engaged in active warfare for around about 72 years. And their situation must have been pretty precarious. So maybe he needed some sort of spin to get the rest of the Egyptian people behind him and uh, so that he could reunite the country into the two lands, the Neptawi again. So maybe Amosi the first, so this is speculation, um, used um, a new form, a new deity, an all-powerful deity, Amun, Amun Ra as um, a figurehead for nationalism to reunite the two lands. So Amun Ra um, became Amun Ra in the 12th dynasty under Semmeswet I. Remember the manifestations of Ra, the Eastern Horus rising, and all these powerful de deities became a form of Ra, Amun Ra. And now we can add the title the king of the gods. So maybe this was uh, Amosis the first spin to get the people of Egypt behind him. So we have this all-powerful deity, Amun-Ra. He's a creator god as well. So that puts him on par with Ptah of Memphis. So again, this is speculation, but maybe Amosi the first is thinking that he's going to centre religious activities in Waset. So Waset is going to be the political centre of the country and also the religious centre of the country because we know that uh, Amosi the first defeated the Hyksos and the Kushites and he became the first king of this 18th dynasty, this new beginning, this new kingdom. Then we had the years of stability with um, his son Amenhotep I, who passed the crown on to his favoured general Tutmosis I. Now Tutmosis I pushed the boundaries of Egypt way out to the, the actual Levant. Tutmosis I also smited the Kushites. He went down into Kush, he captured the gold mines, he gave him a good hiding. You know, now Egypt was going to be a serious contender in the African affairs of the Kushites. 
When Hatshepsut came to power, there had only been two generations of Egyptians who passed from the birth of the 18th dynasty some 72 years later. So an ancient Egyptian generation was between 30 to 40 years. Remember they're dying of Bilharzia worm, very young between 35 and 40. So generation, in my opinion, is roughly about 35 to 40 years. So I believe, uh, having studied uh, the ancient Egyptians for over 30 years, that what Hatshepsut was thinking was that she needed a master plan, a master plan to unite the country. And it was a master plan uh, based on political and religious unity of the country. And it was going to be on, on par with the creator god Ptah at Memphis and also the all-powerful deity of Min. After all, all the three great kings of uh, ancient Egyptian history had all come from Upper Egypt. So in her eyes, she saw that she had the blue bloodline running all the way back to Ahotep, of the uh, 17th dynasty and she saw that really uh, Upper Egypt was now going to be the focal point for the whole country. Great kings remember them, Nama was Upper Egyptian, Nebhepet Ra Montuhotep was Upper Egyptian and Armosi I was Upper Egyptian. So Hatshepsut refurbished the Temple of Mut and she started building a pylon at Karnak and we must assume that she was making some effort to create a Sphinx alleyway, an overland um, route, rather than going by boat up and down um, to the southern harem. And maybe from the evidence, she started building a mud brick temple down at the southern Hari of the southern uh, suites and creating this new deity and installing this new form of Amun. So what we're looking at here is ancient Egyptian spin. Um, there's no TV, there's no internet, there's no t telephones or, or um, radio. So the people get their information by what they're told. And if they're told some certain things, then in their world, they believe it. So this new form of Amun was going to be matching um, the creator god Ptah of Memphis and also the um, seeding god of Min because this was another form of uh, seeding the land. Because the problem the Egyptians have or the problem Hatshepsut had was that Amun-Ra evolved from the old god, so he was part of the element of creation. So she had to explain how he could seed the land. Having another form of him would certainly um, help that story to continue. So Amun of the Southern Sanctuary was visible. Every 10 days he crossed from the East Bank to the West Bank to a temple at Medina Habu. No doubt that's probably why Ramesses III decided to build his mortuary temple at Medina Habu because of the connection with the Amun of the Southern Sanctuary. By making this uh, journey every 10 days to the West, and the West is the gateway to the afterlife, and the place of the ancestors, and the place of rebirth. So he's connected himself with the myth of Osiris. So some, um, some ideas that have come up, so maybe Amun of the Southern Sanctuary was a little bit more, and he evolved in being a divine car spirit for the divine king. So with this ritual of crossing the the Nile every 10 days, he's definitely evolving into a cult of the dead and resurrection. So Hatshepsut's reign, she starts building this southern harem for this new form of Amun, who's going to be able to seed the land. The Theban triad are going to come down to the Opet festival and, in, and they're going to unite with the other form of Amun who's able to seed the land. And from this, evolves this royal car cult later which is about resurrection so let's have a look at the history of luxor temple 
the OPEP festival was celebrated right the way up to the Christian period. And then when the temples were closed, that's when um, the problems really started for Luxor Temple. Because the temple was designed to flood each year with the great inundation, the great flood that started in June. And with that came silt. The idea of locating temples close to the Nile was to reenact creation. So the waters of chaos flooded. And then as um, the flood subsided, the mound appears. And the mythical bird from the east lays the egg on the mound and the sun god Ra is born. So an open court was designed to flood. And uh, again, in the creation myths, there is a forest of papyrus reeds. So that's what the open court means. And I've been over that quite a few times now. So after the uh, waters have subsided, the priests are in the temple, are, they are clearing up. They're getting rid of all of this uh, silt that's come in with this uh, re reenactment. But when the temple is closed, who's going to do it? Well, it was never done. So 500 years of these floods stacked up loads of silt. So 15 metres of silt surrounded Luxor Temple. So if you have a look at the map at F, that's why there's a mosque on top of the temple. Not because the Muslims were trying to be difficult in any way. They knew this was a religious site, but it was this ancient temple was surrounded with 15 meters of silt. So they thought, well, hey, you know, this is a space, we we'll use it. So in 1884, Gaston Maspero starts the excavation and clearance of Luxor Temple. Wow, 1884, remember that? The ongoing um, excavation and clearing of not just the mud, but the rubbish and the stores and houses and huts and pigeon towers all littered all over the top of uh, Luxor Temple. People had to be compensated. And it wasn't until 1960 ACE that the task was finally completed. 76 years of, uh, of time elapsed from 1884 to 1960 to clear this temple.